Adoresi Tirani. You're watching HuffPost Live. Conservative pundit and author Dinesh D'Souza found himself in hot water last year for violating campaign finance laws. He pled guilty to the crime and was sentenced to eight months in a confinement centre in San Diego. But according to him, the experience wasn't in vain. D'Souza shares his story and what he learned in his new book, Stealing America, what my experience with criminal gangs taught me about Obama, Hillary and the Democratic Party. And Dinesh D'Souza joins us now. So Dinesh, thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here. So you violated campaign finance laws, uh, helping your friend Wendy Long with her campaign. What did it feel like to hear that you were going to be going to a confinement center? Well, the whole experience was a little surreal to me because I found myself in a courtroom here in New York. I heard someone call out the United States of America versus Dinesh D'Souza. And, you know, as an immigrant, uh, that sends a strange chill down your spine to have the country, in a sense, against you. Um, and uh, the Obama administration wanted to send me to federal prison, but a, a Clinton appointee judge said no. I got eight months in confinement. Uh, this is in San Diego, a confinement center on the Mexican border. Um, it was a, a very instructive experience because although it was chilling in some respects, I wasn't with white collar criminals. I was with drug smugglers, coyotes, uh, rapists, murderers, the whole gamut. Uh, but after over eight months, I learned something about the criminal underclass and ultimately about American politics that I never would have learned otherwise. So, I mean, you say the criminal underclass. It sounds like you're separating yourself from those people. You were in the same place you know, you were in the same bed. Do you see yourself as differently from those people? Well, initially I said to myself, I'm like an anthropologist who's fallen into Papua New Guinea and I'm studying the natives, but then I realized I am a native. I'm actually one of this group. And I noticed that I shared some of its characteristics. For example, one thing you notice about criminals is a certain kind of shamelessness, a little bit of a up yours attitude toward the system. And initially I thought that's odd. Haven't you guys committed the crimes that you were charged with? But I began to realize that I shared that shamelessness. And part of the reason for this is the recognition. Uh, the criminals have this view. Their view is, we did it. We're guilty. But we're not the big fry. We're the small fry. We're the stupid criminals because we got caught. The real criminals are out there. Uh, they are running the system. In fact, the system never goes after them. They control the system. So do you think that you were a stupid criminal? I was a really stupid criminal, and here's why. Uh, not because my offense was that egregious. I gave $20,000 above the campaign finance limits to a college friend of mine. You broke the, the law. I broke the law, and the reason I was so stupid is I had just made a movie about Obama. I had attacked the most powerful man in the world. I didn't just attack his ideology. I was in his world. I met his grandmother at their family homestead in Kenya. I interviewed his brother in the Haruma slum of Nairobi. I pissed him off. Uh, and so I should have known there's going to be a big fat target on my back and the slightest thing that I do wrong is going to get me FBI agents on me, people checking out my bank records and my tax returns and the full force of the US government against me. So with all due respect, and I do mean this, lots of people piss the president off every single day. Uh, I mean, you know, if you look at John Boehner before he stepped down as the Speaker of the House, he probably pissed the President off more than nearly anybody. Think about Obamacare and the number of times that the House Republicans tried to repeal it. I think it's beyond 50 now. What makes you different in terms of pissing off the President than, say, John Boehner? Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not claiming that I'm in a category uh, all by myself. I'm simply saying that I was a prominent critic of Obama at the very time that this indictment went down. I'm also saying that Obama is a thick-skinned, a thin-skinned narcissist, and he's the kind of guy who doesn't take criticism well. He's extremely arrogant, and he looks at critics not as well-meaning people who disagree with him, but as enemies who need to be taught a lesson. And I think I was taught a lesson, although as it turns out, not the lesson he intended to teach me because I learned things in confinement that opened my eyes into politics in a way that I hadn't known before. But, you know, saying that you were an enemy that needs to be taught a lesson, I mean, you know, you're the, not the only person who has besmirched the president's character, uh, that, you know, that you're not the only person who has attacked the president for things he's done, things he said. Again, I would say, why do you think that the president would have had a personal, because you're not just sort of saying it was the administration, you're, you're very much pointing the finger at Obama himself. Why do you think that President Obama had a personal vendetta? against you? Two reasons. One is that uh, there are lots of guys who write books. I was a think tank guy uh, who wrote books for 20 years. Uh, and I was uh, an annoyance to the left. But when I made a movie, remember I made the second most successful political documentary of all time, seen by seven to eight million people. Uh, it was reaching independent voters during the election. That's number one. So I had a, a reach 
at, during the election that was not common for a normal think tank guy like me. The second thing about Obama is that Obama wrote a book rhapsodizing his father, Dreams from My Father. And I basically said, your dad is a con man. Your dad basically is someone who is an abusive guy. You were physically traumatized by the experience of, of absorbing your father's demented dreams. So I was, in a way, getting to Obama at a level very different from saying, I don't agree with the health care plan. But it sounds like you're saying that you were troubling the president on some kind of psych psychiatric or, you know, sort of psychological, I would say, level. I had an analysis of Obama that went beyond the conventional wisdom at the time. For example, many people said Obama's an amateur, he doesn't get it. I said Obama is trying to shrink America's wealth and power. He's trying to undermine our allies and strengthen our enemies. Now look, with the benefit of hindsight, I think that's turned out to be true. If someone had told you before the Obama administration that in a few years, the United States will be aligned with Iran and an and adversary to Israel, people would say that was nuts. Uh, but that's actually what's happened. I predicted Obama would double the national debt. He has. So the point is I've made a, a, a stinging case against Obama. And I know that the, re the reason I know that I upset him is because a vituperative attack on me and the film, 2016, appeared on the website called BarackObama.com. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I would say that I think some people might take issue with this idea that the United States is aligned with Iran. Yes, that they've struck a, a deal of regarding nuclear power, nuclear energy, uh, but by no means are they now endorsing Iran's connections with Hezbollah, as just an example. But, but let's move on for a second, because it's not just President Obama you seem to take issue with, also Preet Bharara. This is what you said about the U.S. Attorney General for the Southern District of New York when you write, quote, Shortly after my sentence, Eric Holder announced his resignation. I wanted to see if Obama would appoint Preet Bharara to the job. He did not. Instead, he appointed Loretta Lynch, U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. I believe the message was, sorry, Preet, but you didn't come through for us, and now we're not going to come through for you. Our ambitious Indian water carrier will have to wait a bit longer for someone to reward him for his henchman services. Does Do you Preet really believe that Preet Bharara wasn't given the job of Attorney General because he didn't throw the book at you hard enough? Well, the Spreet Barara is a very interesting character. He's known to be actually a very cautious guy, uh, very ambitious, but very cautious. Uh, this is a case normally that should not have been prosecuted with this, this degree of ruthlessness, which is why I suspected that this was not simply an operation out of New York, but possibly had roots in the Justice Department, Eric Holder, and, and the, the White House itself. Now, the point is simply that with Barrara, once you look at the kind of cases that he prosecutes and the way he operates, you see something that I recognize actually from my days growing up in India, a certain kind of uh, approach uh, that is not normally in the United States. I mean, for example, an Indian diplomat was charged with having employing uh, a woman from India, not paying her the minimum wage. So what does Preet Bharara do? He pulls her in and strip searches her. Now, to take an, a dignified Indian woman, a diplomat, and strip, do a cavity search, what does that do to somebody's dignity? People all over India were outraged. The Prime Minister of India denounced it. But what was Bharara really doing in my opinion, he was basically saying to her, I can humiliate you, I can do whatever I want with you, because you're at, at my mercy now, and this is my territory, not yours. That's gangland behavior. That's not really the way that we would expect the Attorney General of the Southern District to behave. So do you really think that Preet Bharara didn't get the Attorney General's job because he didn't throw the book at you hard enough? Look, I, I am... I am a guy who's, uh, who has been in the higher reaches of government. I worked in the Reagan White House. I know how political deals are made. The way the congressmen and senators horse trade is they don't say, you sign a memo that you're going to give me money for this bridge and I'll sign a memo. No. There are understandings. There are uh, uh, communications that basically say, listen, we expect you to do this, and if you do, there's going to be an opening for a big job, and you'll be, you'll be considered very seriously Were these for kind it. of things that you saw while you were working at the Reagan administration? Well, I just noticed in the orbit of government, there's a great deal of horse trading that goes on, uh, uh, while a squid-like cloud of rhetoric is put out to, act to explain these things. The point I want to make about all this is that all we know is Preet Bharara was on the short list to be Attorney General, Somehow he mysteriously vanished from the shortlist, and a relative unknown, Loretta Lynch, was elevated out of nowhere and got the job. So we know the result, and we also know what Preet Bharara was doing right before this. So you talked about the president, uh, and, you know, part of stealing America, I suppose, is, is your thesis that Obama is somehow taking from everyday Americans. You mentioned the, uh, the debt crisis and him doubling the debt. I mean, this has been something that's 
proved to be incorrect numerous times. So, you know, whilst, oh, the, so? Debt, whilst the debt has increased under the president, it was actually inherited uh, from the recession, which, of course, was a prior administration. So to say that he himself was the arbiter of increasing the debt is incorrect. The, well, the debt was eight and a half trillion when Obama took office. It's now 17 trillion. So are you telling me that the recession added seven and a half trillion dollars of debt? Well, the, the facts remain that the state of the economy was a shambles under a previous administration. It wasn't the Obama administration that was the author of that chaos. Of course not. But what I'm saying is when Reagan was in office, the liberals were grumbling about $200 billion deficits as far as the eye can see. Even Bush's largest deficits, there was a lot of howling when Bush reached a half a trillion dollars. So what were annual deficits under Reagan have become monthly deficits under Obama, and yet there's a deafening silence about it among, among the Democrats. What, what, wait, hang on a second. What do you mean about a, by deafening silence? By a deafening silence, what I mean is if you purport to be outraged by deficits, you see a $200 billion deficit, you go, oh, this is intolerable. It's going to, future generations are going to be saddled. But then when your guy comes into office and the deficits are five times as large and you don't say anything, well, that creates the impression that you're being a little hypocritical. Well, I also think that this is a different kind of context as well, of course. So, you know, the Bush administration was operating under different auspices and the Obama administration inherited, uh, of course, a, a, a situation in the economy which was substantially more challenging uh, than the Bush administration. Well, that would explain, look, no one denies that in 2008, 2009, there was a dire situation. I'm not talking about just the stimulus. I'm just talking about the habitual increase in government spending. I'm talking about federal takeovers of huge industries from healthcare to investment banks uh, to finance, now the energy sector. We have seen an expansion of the government's role in the economy that goes way beyond the 2008 banking crisis. Well, I think some people would disagree with you. Philip Bump is just an example in the Washington Post, uh, who has a story behind Obama and the national debt in seven charts. I'll put it in the resource well so everyone can, can check it out. I won't spend more time talking about it here. Uh, part of the book, you're concerned with student loans. Young people in this country, you have a daughter, uh, a young daughter, she's studying as well in London at the moment, uh, and it seems to be that you're very concerned about this. I want to read this excerpt from the book where you say, Obama has actually stolen that money because debt, it should be emphasized, is a form of theft. We are, of course, used to hearing the usual rhetoric about how a huge national debt imposes on future generations. But missing here is the recognition that debt is a form of robbing from young people. Progressives are brazenly ripping of the young, all in the name of social justice. What do you mean by that? All right, now let's say I tell you that you want to go to college, but I'm going to give you a rebate on your student loan. So I'm actually going to let you go to college for free. Now, it isn't actually free for you to go to college because teachers have to be paid and there are costs. So I say now, I'm Obama, and I say, I'm going to put those costs on the federal government. But the federal government doesn't have any money. It has to borrow. So it's going to be borrowing and adding to the debt. Now, who is that debt going to fall upon? It's actually going to fall upon you and your generation. So what I'm really doing is I'm taking your money from the future, your earnings, and I'm giving it to you now. But I'm pretending to be a great guy. I'm actually taking the money out of your wallet and giving it to you. I'm doing you no favor, but I'm acting like I'm your benefactor, and now I expect you to vote for me in return. So this is the progressive con, generosity with other people's money, except in this case, it's not other people's money, it's your money. So you're really questioning progressives as opposed to the president himself. Well, no, I'm saying that there's a certain kind of progressive uh, usurpation of funds, and Obama and Hillary are the masters of the genre. Now, they didn't figure it out themselves. They learned some of it from a shakedown artist like Saul Alinsky. They've put these progressive lessons to effect, and this is a very different progressivism than we saw, for example, with Jimmy Carter uh, or earlier with, uh, with, with Kennedy or even with Truman. So what are you looking for? You know, the student loan crisis isn't going to go away. And I think the, the Democrats and the Republicans, both sides have seen that there is a serious issue when it comes to the kind of debt that young people in this country are saddled with. What would be your solution? Well, my solution is that I think the reason that college costs have been escalating so rapidly is not because there's an actual increase of costs. It's not that they're paying professors all that much more. It's not because facilities cost more. In fact, technology in every other sector is driving costs down. So the reason college costs are going up is precisely because the government is providing more money. Every time the government says we'll increase the Pell Grant so we'll give more aid, colleges go, wonderful, we'll raise prices. So we've kind of got a racket that's going on between the colleges and the government and both of them together are ripping off the taxpayer. So 
To me, the solution basically is new forms of education, typically online, lower high quality, low cost. I think we're going to see the whole college system transformed over the next decade. Well, one of the areas I think lots of people seem to agree on both sides is, is STEM. This idea of you know the sciences, technology, engineering, math is something that we really should be encouraging our young people to get into. Um, you tweeted out this uh, uh, earlier this, this month. You said, will Obama now call on ISIS? to bring its clocks to the White House. Uh, you know, you're referring to Ahmed, the young boy who was uh, ca caught out for bringing a clock to school the police were called. Are you really comparing this young man to ISIS? No, the, the point I was making is not so much uh, a critique of Ahmed. The point I was trying to make is he didn't bring a clock in the sense of my watch to the, to the school. What he brought was a dismantled clock. That science you, project. Yeah, that if you look at it, is a little scary looking. In other words, it, 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 it looks like there's all kinds of electronics. It's all Dinesh, dismantled. Hold on. It was a science project. He, ex exactly. But, but let me say this. Had there been an explosion in that school, in retrospect, wouldn't everybody say, gee, isn't it weird? This guy brought this contraption into the school. Nobody thought to check it out. Nobody thought to investigate further. He kept displaying it into every class and yet no one. So my point is, with the benefit of hindsight, it's very easy to say that was harmless. The truth of it is everything is harmless at the beginning until something goes wrong. Look at this young man. You're saying that at some point in 20 years time, they're going to play back this conversation of you and I and say, well, you see, that there you go. He committed this crime or he's akin to ISIS now. And don't you wish you'd had the benefit of hindsight? See, I'm worried that the Obama administration is doing the kind of vetting of the Syrian refugees similar to you. Look at this man. He looks so kind. Look. To look at the kid, he's a normal kid. I have no objection to him. I don't think that he meant anything by bringing the clock. He had I'm, a science project. He was but, doing his schoolwork. He but, didn't mean anything apart from right, being a good student. Right, but in an age of terrorism, it is not wrong for the authorities to say, you know what? Let's check this out. Let's just make sure that this clock is just a clock. You can't fall. Obama was acting as if the Texas authorities were a bunch of, of redneck, anti-Muslim Islamophobes. No, they weren't. They were just trying to make sure that the other kids in that school were safe. Well, you mentioned Syrian refugees there. Uh, this is another thing that you've been tweeting about in the last few days, particularly after the Paris attacks. Uh, None of the arbiters of the Paris attacks are Syrian refugees. None of them are refugees at all. Three of them were born in Paris. Three of them are from Brussels. Um, why do you continue to perpetuate this idea that refugees have anything to do with the attacks? I don't perpetuate the idea. The point I'm making is that ISIS is very active in Syria. I ISIS controls Syrian towns. And so... Absolutely, and that's undisputed. Yeah. Undisputed, right. And now when you have a large influx of Syrians into Europe and into the United, the United States, it, if you were ISIS, wouldn't you think that this was a rather easy way to send ISIS guys into Europe and the United States? Wouldn't that be a, a convenient and natural thought to you if you were trying to figure out how to get, for example, an ISIS sympathizer to Chicago? Wouldn't you say, you know what, all these refugees, they're going anyway, 100,000 of them. Can they possibly vet them all? I mean, you try to vet the guys I went to high school with, try to figure out who their friends are. This is in Mumbai. You wouldn't be able to do it. It's impossible. So this is a wonderful opportunity for ISIS. We should be aware of that, and that simply means we need to, pr to do heightened scrutiny. We need to be really careful because we know that the enemy can easily get through our borders this way. Well, heightened security. So I understand in Europe, for example, they have the Schengen Agreement, which is basically an open border agreement. This is certainly something that both the French authorities, the authorities in Brussels, are going to be looking at a lot closely. They have said so in the last few days as well since the attacks, that they're going to be looking at intelligence sharing a little bit more. That all makes sense. With regards to the United States and refugees coming into the US, how do you see that there is the same kind of threat that could be in Europe as there is for refugees coming into the United States? See, I think when I look at the reaction to the Paris attacks, I'm not so much scared by ISIS as I am scared by the rather serene, almost whimsical, uh, almost annoyed and indifferent tone of Obama. Con contrast Obama with Hollande. So here's Hollande. He sounds like Churchill, right? He, these are barbarians. I'm going to be merciless. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Here's Obama. Well, that was kind of a setback. And now we have another apparently attempted bombing in Germany. I guess another averted setback. Well, these aren't just setbacks. Uh, a setback is when you, I mean, Obama says ISIS is contained. I guess very inconveniently the next day, the Paris attacks. So there 
not contain. But how can an organization that is controlling towns in Afghanistan uh, and Syria, that is downing a Russian airliner, uh, that is causing havoc in France, how can that be considered a JV team? How can that be considered contained? Well, the, the, the JV comment, I think, he's since clarified. And that notion of containment, um, you know, I'm not going to speak for the president, but he certainly has said that he clarified that he meant that physically they are still within the confines of Syria and Iraq, uh, and they're, they're not setting up cali mini caliphates in Paris, as an example. But to go back to my question, you didn't answer it, in terms of Syrian refugees coming to the United States, how can you see that they are posing any kind of actual serious threat when there have been no crimes committed by refugees. Germany put out a report that Germany that has taken over 100,000 refugees has said that their crime level hasn't increased once since they, not even by one percentage point, since they introduced and allowed refugees into their country. Right, but remember that the whole point of terrorism is to do what hasn't been done before. Right, before 9-11, planes were never used to, to go into buildings. So if you had said, listen, what's wrong with giving Islamic radicals flight lessons because they've never flown planes into, planes into buildings? Yes, but that's, that, that's because that's the new idea that occurred to them. So I'm simply saying now, something that we would previously be naive about, refugees, they're running away from persecution, uh, we ought to take them in with open arms. And I, all I'm saying is now we realize, wait a minute, uh, um, these refugees can be used as a way to smuggle bad guys into the United States. That to me sounds a bit like minority report politicking though. Well, I think to me it sounds exactly like reading common sense into the headlines. So uh, again... But the common sense I, I think is, is taking a huge leap from facts that are just not there uh, and then using these immaterial, non-existent facts to then craft policy. Let me ask you which this. doesn't sound intelligent to me. If, if, if someone said to you, uh, here, is, here are the resources to cover the expense, would you take a dozen of these refugees into your house, knowing as little as we do about them, uh, and would you feel safe? But we do, um, we do know a lot about them, because the process to actually be a refugee in the United States can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months, the way that they're scrutinized. I mean, you, know, you said to yourself, you're an immigrant, I'm an immigrant, I have an accent, I'm here on a visa. The process for me to get any kind of visa is ridiculously inordinate. And I'm somebody who has, you know, presence on online, in, in but newspapers, we're not talking about all this. about that. No, I know. But we're, we're talking, we're, we're we're talking, talking about, about how can you, you're saying, how can you verify that this person, 12 people, 12 Syrians were to come into your house, how do you know that they're not anything dubious or criminal? Because the investigation and the background check that the Department of Homeland Security currently requires is around 18 months long. But the refugee process tends to circumvent those things. We're talking about it taking. It doesn't circumvent. We're those talking things. about taking a hundred thousand people in a relatively short time. When when you're talking about no one's taking a hundred thousand. The president had mentioned ten thousand. Well, no, uh, t ten thousand maybe immediately, but the, the the numbers that have been talked about are much much larger than that. Europe is taking a lot, and we're taking a lot. Look, the French are now saying we need to reassess the process. We just need to look at it harder. I'm very pro-immigrant. I'm an immigrant, and I are my politics. Pro, are you pro-immigrant? Of course I am. My politics come out of that. This country was built by immigrants and to me the great power of conservatism the reason I call myself a conservative is I want a ladder of opportunity that I can climb up I don't what do you think of the way that some of the 2016 candidates have been talking about immigrants uh, the you know front runners Ben Carson Donald Trump have been making some very disparaging remarks about immigrants do you think that they're the wrong people to be leading the charge for the Republicans for 2016 well first of all I do think the Republican Party uh, should not and cannot be the party Party against immigration, no. Uh, but I do think that there is a legitimate frustration with illegal immigration. Uh, no country can be a real country while having, in a sense, a completely porous border. If you go down to the border, as I did last year, you basically fence, you see fences that keep stopping, fences with huge holes in them so that you can actually drive a car through them. So this is a fraud. This is a, an attempt to say to the American people, we have a fence, but look, you can come right through right here. And there's no one to stop you if you do. So I don't know if that, I don't believe that that's true. I don't believe that I mean, I've been down to Tijuana as well, and I think that if I try and get through the line with my passport, I'm going to be stopped by the police. No, don't be silly. There's We're not talking about going through the line. There's a, little, there's a little border post here, and then there are miles and miles of fence, and all I'm telling you is if you simply follow those fences, you will see the fence stops, and it literally becomes open country. You so can just walk across a, the border. I think there's a, there's a big difference between border security, which I think people on both sides agree is necessary. I mean, you know, we are a, a sovereign country, and of course there needs to be border security. We have security. laws. And we have laws, absolutely. Absolutely. But there is a big difference between that and then talking about whole people 
as Donald Trump did, as rapists, as an example. Do you think that the front runners, Donald Trump and Ben Carson, are getting it wrong when it comes to immigration? Well, I think that, the, as I say, I think that they are reflecting a deep frustration about the fact that the United States, the federal government, the states are doing better, but the federal government refuses ultimately to maintain borders. Now, as someone who went through the legal process, as I assume you did, it took us a lot of time, and it also cost us a fair bit of money, uh, and we had to play by the rules, and we had to stand in line, and we did. So why would we condone, as immigrants, a process that allows other guys, just as in the same way as you're standing in the Starbucks line, some guy walks so the front pushes everybody aside, orders a Starbucks, everyone in line is going to tell them to get out of the line. Get in line. That's all I'm saying. So in terms of 2016, who are you rooting for? Well, I'm not taking sides among the Republicans because I actually believe that this kind of inter and squabble, I'm going to let the Republicans sort that one out. I'm, foc I'm making a movie on a secret history of progressivism and the Democratic Party and Hillary. So I'm putting my attention a little bit more on the other side. But surely, I mean, for the, for the Republicans to have any kind of chance at being able to defeat these people who you see as ruining the country, you need to be invested in what's going on because they need to mount a robust challenge. Right. So I haven't uh, endorsed anybody. I haven't taken a side. I'm watching with some interest. I think the process is still kind of early. People are coming up. People are going down. I think also people's full strengths have not been put on display yet. So once Who, who's weak? Who's, who's weak at the moment that is actually really, really strong, but we just haven't seen it? Well, I mean, I think, for example, that there are strengths in Cruz and Rubio that haven't fully played themselves out. These are extremely competent people. They're young, and in some senses, they're unseasoned. But, but think of how unseasoned Obama was in 2008. So I think that there is room uh, for uh, new faces to surface and people who are now in the middle of the pack to move more to the front. I'll be watching with interest to see what happens. But like I say, um, uh, my movie is really going to focus on the, on the left side of the aisle. Will you make any campaign donations to any 2016 candidates? I will be avoiding those. Uh, Dinesh, thank you so much for joining us today on Half Post Live. Appreciate my, you being here. My pleasure. Uh, and guys, you can check out It's Stealing America. What my experience with criminal gangs taught me about Obama, Hillary, and the Democratic Party it hits the shelves today. Links in the resource well below. Stick around, more Half Post Live coming up next.